everybody for waiting just a few minutes. Um, and I'm excited to have uh, this first event tonight in a new series with the Camden Rockport Historical Society. Um, thank you for joining us on Zoom on this snowy evening. Um, before we get started, uh, I'll remind you, you can type in your questions or comments in the chat or the Q&A, and I'll read them out loud at the end. Um, and I'm delighted that we have Irene Drago here for a presentation tonight about weaving Maine's shipbuilding history into compelling fiction. And um, first, I'll turn it over to Jan Kelsey from the Camden Rockport Historical Society to introduce Irene. Okay. Hi, uh, folks. Um, welcome and thanks for staying home, staying safe, and joining in on Zoom tonight for our first, our kickoff for our first uh, re we revived speaker series, winter speaker series for the Camden Rockport Historical Society. We did this for many years and um, it kind of got killed by COVID. But what we gained from that was Zoom. So tonight we'd be canceled if it wasn't for Zoom. So yay. Um, I uh, went to hear Irene Drago in Cushing in August, and she was talking about her latest book, uh, Lavinia Wren and the Sailmakers. I purchased that and I was delighted uh, with reading historical fiction from our own area. Um, and the, there's so, I've discovered so much history uh, in this area since I've been involved with the Historical Society. And I'm just blown away by it. And so I invited her to come and speak for us and, and uh, speak a little bit about some of Camden's history. Um, she will talk to us, I think, a little bit about the Holly Bean uh, Shipyard in Camden. And um, without any further ado, I'm going to let her tell us about that. So, uh, Irene? Well, lives in Bath, and she's with us on Zoom. Well, hi, and, and thank you, Janet, and the um, Camden Rockport Historical Society, and also Julia for hosting this through the Camden Library. And um, although I'm disappointed I can't be, I've visited Camden Library a few times. I know how lovely it is, and it's certainly right there on the harbor, a perfect spot. Disappointed I can't be with you in person, but yes, Thank you to technology. Um, although sometimes in my house, I struggle with it, um, but we're here. And what you're going to see is an illustrated talk because I am very much um, a sensual person in terms of tactile, but visual. And I have to see a place and feel a place to really write about it. And what I am talking about tonight is how I use real history and real places and real people um, as a touchstone to inspire my fiction. And very often the real people walk through the fiction, but I create fictitious characters. For example, Lavinia Wren doesn't exist, but um, major character in the book, Charles Ranlett Flint and Captain Arthur J. Elliott are very flesh and blood, real people who had families and um, were part of a vibrant community. And so their stories remain as they truly were or as true as I can get it, not having walked with them in that period of time. But my fictitious characters, well, we can have a little play with them. And um, as I research, I realize there are many discrepancies in historical reporting, even a place or a year or a name sometimes. And that's why I like to write fiction and not nonfiction. I'm as accurate as I can be, but my fictitious characters, I have that emotional room um, as well to play with. So we're looking at a screen that shows you a shipyard in Maine, and that would be Percy and Small written by Ralph Linwood Snow and Captain Duncan Lee. And this is kind of Douglas Lee, and it's kind of my go-to uh, reference book in terms of a lot of the wooden hull um, schooners. But I also have in the center where the mountain meets the sea. And 
when Janet approached me, I had yet to use Camden as my focus. But at the very end of Lavinia Wren, I have a character, uh, someone who actually marries into the family, uh, Lavinia Wren's son, so it would be her daughter-in-law, who comes from a prominent Cam Camden family. And I also mention the lime industry a little bit, and that would involve Rockland, Rockport, uh, lime and the Rock Railroad, and how those communities were connected, not just by the sea, but by supporting industries. And um, that played a major role. So um, this book, The Mountains Meet the Sea, is very critical in my presentation tonight. And that the vessel below the book is actually the Eleanor Percy, which was the second six-masted schooner ever built. Because as you know, the first six-masted great schooner ever built was from the Holly Bean Yard in Camden. And what I realized as I began to compare communities like Bath, the city of ships, and Camden, and Thomaston, a village that went to sea, was that how very connected all three of those communities were. So that's where we begin the front screen. And again, because I write fiction, um, the reason for all my research and why I would talk to a historical society is just how much deep research I do. And then that fictional element. So some quotes I've pulled over the years that really describe what I do would come from um, Lin-Manuel Miranda. Um, I was a Spanish teacher, so Miranda to most people. And we all know him from Hamilton, who lives, who dies, who tells your story. Um, a quote from me, one that I, I truly believe reflects all of my novels. I pull the thread of love, not war through history. Because as a former teacher, a language teacher, I do know that we teach history chronologically, starting back in this country to the Revolutionary War and moving forward. So um, that's a very strong feeling. Um, Walt Whitman, actually one of my literary critics after my, I wrote my first novel, uh, wrote this. He said, Walt Whitman once said, as soon as histories are properly told, there'll be no need of romances. And he was very sweet, it was Bill Bushnell, who said, but that author may prove him wrong. So I always like to mention that. I think there is a lot of truth in Walt Whitman's words. Gabriel Garcia Marquez, again, um, I was a Spanish teacher, so 100 Years of Solitude, or Cien Años de Soledad, wrote, all of history is a myth. I'm not sure that's true, but if you take it back to Lin uh, Manuel Miranda, uh, it's who's telling the story that really makes it go the way it goes. And Bernard Cornwell, you probably know him. He inspired uh, The Last Kingdom Netflix series. Uh, we'll always say historical fiction has a big story and a little story. And if I write seafaring family love stories, you know that I'm interested in the little stories in the big history. Um, I believe as today, there are always conflicts in the world. War is a constant, but it's love that helps us survive. And that love usually begins with a family. And so the essence of my way of surviving history um, is to concentrate on the love. The background to this picture, very maritime, actually comes from the Arthur Sewell Shipyard Office, which is around the corner from where I'm sitting right now. I'm facing the Kennebec uh, in my home in this position and just a little bit to the north, um, to my left and down Holly Street at the foot of Holly and Front Street, the shipyard office still remains. And these little cubbies that are beautiful, solid, um, I believe oak, that have the names of the vessels they built. You see the Roanoke and the Shenandoah and the Benjamin Packard and the Occidental and the Challenger and on and on, the Susquehanna. They had all of the plants and those plans were donated to the museum here in town, uh, Maine Maritime Museum. But all that gold lettering reflects Arthur 
Sewell and Company. And Edward Sewell, who you can see his name under Who Tells, lived in the house that I'm sitting in right now. So I, I kind of live and breathe maritime history right now. And to quote Faulkner, history is, not was. So a historical moment. As we move forward, just reflecting on the three books, if you're not familiar, Daughters of Longreach, my first, very much based in Bath, um, Main Tides, Bring a Family Home. The main point, if you're meeting with us by Zoom from Thomaston or Cushing or Tenants Harbor, St. George, you're probably gonna recognize Marshall Point Lighthouse. And since we've been battered by such storms, I think we appreciate our coast and our lighthouses more and more. And um, my third and most recent, which was launched in October of 2022 at historic Watts Hall on Main Street, Thomaston, is Lavinia Wren and the Sailmakers. And that novel was inspired by the Dunn and Elliott family, the shipyard and the sail loft. So um, it's only fitting tonight that we have Percy and Small from Bath and Dunn and Elliott from Lavinia Wren. And so the Holly Bean Yard is yet to be written about. But since meeting uh, Janet Kelsey and Cushing, I've done a lot of research and I have found some very fascinating seeds to plant. Um, Holly Bean, Camden's most famous shipbuilder, and some historians would argue most famous shipbuilder in Maine, but it seems to depend on who's telling the story. So um, are we gonna talk about Captain Sam Percy? Are we gonna talk about Captain Arthur Elliott or George Elliott and Thomas Dunn? Um, or Holly Bean and his son, Robert Bean? And when I mentioned families and history and how we're connected by the sea, but often in Maine and in shipbuilding communities, we're connected by blood. There seems to be a lot of father-son and father-daughter and um, brothers that come through. And those threads tend to make for some drama, family drama. So Holly Bean came to Camden by way of Belfast and Tenants Harbor. In fact, his son, uh, who I'm gonna talk about also, Robert Bean was born in Tenants Harbor. Um, Holly Bean really started learning uh, his trade as a shipwright and then becoming a master shipbuilder in Belfast. And by the time he got to Camden, he was very experienced. And he opened his yard um, on the east side of the harbor um, in the 1870s. And of course, we can't talk about the Holly Bean Yard without talking about the first six-masted schooner. Now, if you know your maritime history, Maine produced 10, well, nine out of the 10 six-masted schooners built um, in the United States. And the only one that wasn't built in Maine was built in Quincy, Massachusetts, and that would be the William Douglas two S's on the end. And I find that interesting in and of itself because I'm working on a new project and that name Douglas comes in. So um, always seeing how we connect. The George Wells was launched August 14th, 1900. And when it was launched, there were 15,000 people watching and celebrating, fully rigged with all her flags flying on that day in August. And it was a race. And we're gonna talk about the competitive nature of these shipbuilders and perhaps that term that really uh, was created more in the 1850s and, and continued into the early 1900s, live Yankees. What exactly is a live Yankee? Well, it really describes the shipbuilders and their entrepreneurial spirit and they're stretching a dollar and they're making things work and, um, a little bit dreamer, a little bit gambler, um, pretty exciting people living big and bold lives and certainly a risky business as we delve into how these vessels were built and how they met their end. Um, a lot of high drama on the high seas. So the George Wells beat out Percy and Small, a bigger shipyard in Bath, 
by just a few months. The Eleanor A. Percy was launched October 10th of 1900. And she was bigger, but she wasn't the first. And when Eleanor Percy came along, you saw her image in that first slide introduced in the talk. Um, she was one of the three largest vessels ever built. And two of those vessels ahead were Arthur Sewell around the corner from where I'm sitting, his uh, last square rigs, the Shenandoah and the Roanoke. So you saw the cubbies that once upon a time held the plans for those giant square riggers. But the Eleanor Percy being that six masted schooner was unique as well. The story behind this picture is that as the first six masted schooner, one year later on salt water, she collided with the Eleanor Percy. Now she collided with, or she was hit by, that's part of the exciting history you can weave into a drama. The captain of the George Wells was really uh, a great partner of Holly Bean. And his name was John Crowley. And Captain John Crowley, I haven't written a book yet, but I'm already enthralled by his history. Very much like Captain Sam Percy, he went to sea young, but younger than Captain Sam. He was 10 years old and he was the um, assistant to the cook. And the description says, a Chinese cook, because on these crews, square rigs and schooners, there were really people from around the world. There was a Swede, there was an Irishman, there were Chinese, there were um, Italians. It was in and of itself a diverse little place, the world onto a world. And um, he learned from 10 years old on by doing and was a sea captain, a shipmaster at the age of 21. Captain Sam Percy on the other end of this talk went to sea at 18. He was the son of a shipbuilder. His stepfather, his father he had never met was a sea captain also very connected from birth. And um, he waited until he was 18 because he worked in his father's shipyard and before that his um, sawmill. So the Wells collides with Eleanor Percy and Cat, and I have to quote because this shows you how smooth this live Yankee was. He said, when asked whose fault was it, just like two cars colliding on a road, just who was to blame, I do not care to say. I did not run into anyone, as you can see from the cavern in the well side. We had a headwind, the Percy had a fair wind. Further comment, I do not care to make at this time. Sounds like a great politician, possibly thinking of running for office. And ironically, many shipbuilders and some sea captains, including another captain that lived in my house, Captain Guy Goss of Goss, Sawyer and Packard Shipyard, did become state legislators, maybe mayors of their city or town, um, joining a selectman, but they did play many roles in their communities and were community leaders. They also, the Holly Bean Shipyard in particular, because let me talk about why he's so famous. He built um, the largest five-masted schooner ever built. And that vessel broke a lot of records. So I could do some comparisons on that uh, with Percy and Small and others, but uh, kind of fun to mention that he built the largest five master, the first six master, the second third masted vessel schooner, and the second fourth masted vessel. You get the feeling that they kept score, like people keep baseball stats and who were the heavy hitters. And they also were racing and perhaps not by chance, um, several men in this industry raced horses, including Holly Bean. Um, he had, by the end of his career, um, built 77 vessels, but he also owned a racetrack and a stable with race horses and would travel all around. On the other end, the master builder of the Eleanor Percy, Miles Mary, 
also enjoyed horses. He didn't have the same wealth as Holly Bean, but he did have a few race horses and was known to race them himself, be the jockey and would travel around the state of Maine. And when we get to Holly Bean's son, we can talk about horse racing again. So cars and trucks and things that go and schooners and square rigs and horses. Um, I think these were men who had an eye for transportation. What you're seeing here is a, um, a supporting industry and the Alden Anchor Company formed by two brothers, um, Horatio and William, the W here stands for the William. Um, this anchor company, they would say, could be heard late at night, the fires and sparks flying. I can tell you on the Wyoming, uh, the largest six master ever built that was launched in 1909 out of Percy and Small, they had two anchors, 60 tons a piece, 120 tons worth. So when you're saying, well, the Wyoming weighed 3,730 registered tons, you're including the anchors. And the same would be for the five masted and of course the wells. Um, this anchor company was sold to uh, Major Bird out of Rockland in 1901, because you begin to see in the late 1800s, really when Percy and Small just opened in 1894 and the yard in 1897, coming together as partners, the age of wooden hull shipbuilding was ending. Holly Bean launching the largest five masted schooner in 1899. And for those of you who keep score, I'm gonna give you the name, it's the John something, but I have to tell you, I, I have learned an awful lot about the vessels now built in Camden and the names are all swirling in my head. But that five masted vessel was launched in 1899. BIW, Bath Ironworks in 1892 launched the first all steel gunboats for the US Navy, the Machias and the Castine within six months of each other. So 1892, 1893, definitely on the Kennebec and I think on the Georges. And if you go up to Camden, they all knew the steam and steel were on the horizon. So what made them continue building the large great schooners, and you have to be four, five, or six masted to be a great schooner. It was one seven masted, but it, it wasn't bigger than the Wyoming and not built by Percy and Small or a Holly Bean. They kept building because of coal. Coal became the major cargo, and they were smart enough to know, wow, you have a wooden hull vessel without engines, just that big hull, and let's make them bigger. Let's build the four, the five, and the six and you can fill it with, in case of the Wyoming, 6,000 um, tons gross, so you're doing volume, one ton per 100 cubic feet, that kind of thing. Um, and for the wells, 5,000 tons of coal. So they were very profitable to run. Um, Robert Bean, who was the only surviving son of Holly Bean, his first marriage, um, became a partner actually joined the yard as a junior partner in 1900 and um, built alongside his father. But his father understood that they were at the end of the run. And a quote that comes from Camden, one of your historians that I think you'll all recognize the name, Barbara um, Dyer, I believe her name is, right there, courtesy of Barbara Dyer, the picture of Robert L. Bean. She used to say that Holly Bean, while he was building his schooners, would say that water and wind was the cheapest mode of transportation. But when he retired, he felt it no longer was. Um, his son, however, being a younger man, was driven to continue and to keep the yard running. So here's where I fall into the the lots of different facts reported in the early 1900s. And even when you check sources online, one little number changes. So it was reported that in April, 1907, Holly Bean retired. 
um, he sold his shipyard, 1907, 1908. I saw both years. Either way you look at it, there's also um, a discrepancy. If I look at where the mountain meets the sea, he sold it to a Dr. Bisbee. If I look to one of Barbara Dyer's articles that appears online from the Courier Gazette from um, 2018, he signed it to a Dr. Phelps. And that name was interesting because Phelps was one of the summer residents who helped save the Magunta Cook Bank, um, kept it solvent so the depositors of the bank didn't lose a single dollar. And this is very wonderful life, uh, Bedford Falls type of story here. Um, the bank almost failed and Robert L. Bean was convicted of embezzlement of $19,000 um, to keep his shipyard running. Again, uh, the financial times were changing for shipbuilders, wooden hull shipbuilders in particular. Um, he was convicted along with a woman, uh, um, a Miss Ella, uh, and I can't remember that last name, um, and it was very tragic because his father died shortly after his crime uh, came to the surface. And Robert really tried in 1908 um, when it was sold, or let's say it was 1907, um, he leased the yard back and he built two right away. Um, of course, it takes a, a few months to do these things. I think it took eight months and eight days uh, to build the Wyoming, so months for sure. And he built two three-masted schooners, kept the yard going for three years, and then hit a wall. So he closed it, but always trying that live Yankee to get the investors, find new money. I mean, Captain Sam went to Wyoming to get um, Governor Brooks to participate. Robert L. Bean, likewise, went to New York City, and he came back with the largest contract Knox County had ever seen, a half a million dollars from New York investor or investors. And he built, it was a contract for five four-masted schooners. And if you look up the article from Barbara Dyer, 2018, she talks about the controversy. The first one that was built quickly and it was named Percy Pine the second, had no flags, no christening, nothing like the Wells, but um, a German diesel engine arrived and was installed by a German mechanic. And then 10 German men came and took the vessel. And it was thought that it was going to be used as a commercial raider. This is um, before World War I, obviously, and that's a story um, that your historian has shared. So history provides a lot of intrigue, and this would be a case where Walt Whitman would say, here's a son of a shipbuilder trying to keep things going. Also in 1921, there was a fire. And I know from being a docent at the Percy and Small Yard, and really anyone who's really thinking about it, a wooden hull shipyard, fire is the greatest threat. Um, Percy and Small lost theirs in 1913 and rebuilt. Robert Bean lost his and the tools of his workers. And they couldn't save it. And they really didn't have the capital to rebuild. They were struggling. So, um, it's interesting because most of the shipwrights of that day owned their own tools. That was a devastating blow. The bean yard, by the way, was open nine hours a day at a time when most were open 10. And they had very well-qualified shipwrights at um, as many as 100 in the yard. So it was a big operation. And so Robert Bean, career ended with disgrace and he lost the shipyard. The very last vessels that he built, the second to last was the Robert L. Bean. He actually built 10 schooners in five years from that 1915 to 1920 when it came to an end. That year 1920, 
repeats and repeats in history. And I always say that, well, the Wyoming was wrecked off the of Pollock Rip off of Cape Cod. And that was in 1924. In 1920, Dunn and Elliott had launched the their only, first and only five-masted schooner, the Edna Hoyt. And they sold their shipyard holding on to the sail loft and their store in 1924. So you begin to see the connection between all three of these yards and an author is gonna focus on those years. They're dramatic, there's a lot. And there are a lot of families that are in transition. In this picture, circa 1875, which I have to say is kind of a golden period. Obviously the 1850s, prior to the Civil War were the boom. But by 1875, um, the guy who lived in my house, Guy Sawyer and pa Packard, they were doing really well. Uh, many of the Thomaston shipyards, definitely Dunn and Elliott were doing well. And they had just opened their own sail loft, not leasing space from Edward O'Brien down Water Street at the foot of Green Street um, on Water Street. And this sail loft, still stands. I believe it's one of, or if not the last uh, of those historic buildings still on the waterfront. And as note, courtesy of Ida Elliot Clark, who is the granddaughter of Captain Arthur Elliot, who I met at the Cushing Library doing a talk very much like this shortly after I had published Daughters of Longreach. So, History is not was, and we are definitely connected by salt water here. Um, in this picture, the two gentlemen with the hats are the owners, and they're working alongside of their men. So live Yankees, you, this entrepreneurial spirit, this I'm going to work, it's hard, but I, I make lemonade out of lemons is definitely present in this picture. Everybody is busy and they don't really look glum in that way. They're energizing. I find this photograph energizing. You can spot the ship's knees, uh, especially to the right of that would be George Elliott in the background and Thomas Dunn, their cousins actually in the forefront. And that's a lot of duck uh, making waves. Many people believe and say in the industry, Dunn and Elliott, were top of the heap, best suit of sales you could find anywhere. I can tell you that the Wyoming had 12,000 yards of sale, and that's a lot of weight too. So when you're totaling up the tonnage and Dunn and Elliott would refit the vessels, they would only last a year or two. And when we begin to talk about the wrecks, boy, many, especially on the six masted vessels, the masts were lost. Many people said they weren't really being that large uh, built for being ship, ships that sailed the world and made of wood. They were large and they were exposed to have a lot of those masts lost in a storm. Um, I write seafaring family love stories. If you're gonna pull that thread of love, not war, if you're making sails, uh, those men are working hard for families. Captain Arthur Elliott, is the son of George Eliot, who was pictured in the background there. And Captain Arthur, not unlike Holly Bean's son, he went into the family business. Unlike Robert Bean, he was a captain first and always called Captain Arthur in his community and very involved as were his uncles and his cousins. And he became a partner in the firm. Thomas Dunn had a son in the firm. George Eliot had several. Captain Arthur walked, uh, worked alongside of his brothers and uh, not all of them, you know, one became a doctor, one went to New York City um, and worked for banks and investments. You see all these connections. The little baby he's holding is Albert. And if you saw in my first slide and in the promos, the envelope to tell you how history is and that was and what this history meant to people, um, I don't know if you see my camera, if you're seeing it. I have that envelope. Ida recently sent this to me. It's addressed to Mr. Albert Elliott, uh, 12 cents, the stamps, 
Uh, they've got Franklin Delano Roosevelt on the stamps. And this was mailed in 1968. The Dun and Elliott store was still operating. And it comes from a man, Lawrence Weston in Waldboro, Maine, all mid coast. And in his own handwriting is written the names, the weight, the builder of the 10 six masted schooners. And it's, um, he also tallies how many five were built in um, Maine, 59 five masted, 454 masted, 1,105 three masted, of course the 10 six masted with the one, as he says, the William Douglas um, built in Quincy. Seven out of the 10 were built at Percy and Small. One, the first was built at the Holly Bean Yard in Camden. One was built in Rockland. Um, that's quite a lot of history for the mid coast of Maine. And this is a family that was very much for generations apart um, because it started with a block maker, John Elliott, who came from Wiscasset and went to Thomaston. And when I talk about supporting industries, we looked at the anchors, we had the sail makers, you had coopers, and of course you had block makers. You're building on the ways and you needed the blocks. This is a schooner. If we um, have weather and have seen weather and um, the fish houses that were wiped away, the history in Portland, um, so iconic in photographs, a pier, if you're the St. George message board, someone's pier was almost washed away and managed to get it back. This is the E Star Jones, which Captain Arthur Elliott was in command of. And it is frozen, much like Disney's frozen vessel in the movie, but this is real. This is not fiction. And, um, I'm just amazed by it. And he, I was told by Ida Elliott uh, Clark that he had this photograph taken for insurance purposes because they thought it was gonna be a total loss, but they did break free and they did eventually make it home. So quite the photograph to talk about the drama and the, the risk involved. I also love to see the faces of the people who did the work. Shipwright, the fancy name if you're not from seafaring people for ship carpenters, the joiners do the finishing work. Um, this photo was probably taken before 1912. Uh, Miles Mary, Percy and Small's master shipbuilder is not in this photo, but in all of my research, I come across these names like Levi and Rufus and James and I, mustaches and their bow ties and their flat hats. And I'm, I'm just amazed by their strength and fortitude and inspired to write their stories. And you look at their faces and what's very interesting is many shipwrights continued working into their seventies. If they weren't killed by an accident and there was no safety involved, no, ear protection, so the caulkers were all deaf. Percy and Small only hired deaf men to be caulkers. Um, if you think about being in the mill and the saws, the jigsaw and the beveled and, and how many chips are flying for eyesight, and of, of course the scaffolding on these huge vessels, you begin to realize that um, it's amazing. And they built all year long for the most part. Um, the Donnell Yard in Bath closed for the hard winter months of January, February, March. Percy and Small, the Deering Yard, um, all the others were pretty much open. I'm including this photograph because there are 22 masts, if you count, and the six masted vessel in the water, if you're looking at the screen to the right, is the Eleanor Percy. And just north of her to her left on the water is the um, Carnegie, the William Carnegie. So you have the William Carnegie and you have the Eleanor Percy. And then on the blocks, another six masted, the Edward B. Winslow and the Fuller Palmer that are, Percy and Small had a north and a south building ways, unusual. And at times, 
they actually rented the yard to the south, uh, which belonged to Guard Deering after 1900. But prior to that was John McDonald's master builder because Chapman and Flint took over that yard when the railroad, the Knox Lincoln Railroad went through Thomaston displacing uh, eminent domain, their yard at the foot of Ship Street. It moved to Bath. And so it was the neighboring yard to where Percy Small would open in 1897. But by then John McDonald was retiring and Guard Deering uh, took it over. So there were actually three yards operating in a 20 acre space. In the 1850s, why I love the 22 mass, there were 22 shipyards on the Kennebec uh, in Bath, Longreach, and of course more if you go up to Richmond and Hollowell and beyond. So this is quite an amazing, um, if you've been to the Maine Maritime Museum, the house on the right, which is uh, owned by a hide, is no longer there. That's the museum itself. And you can see the mill uh, really in the center. Um, the blacksmith shop is um, more to the right and covered by the trees a little bit. Eleanor Percy, there she stands. Um, the second six master. Oh, it's like being salutatorian or getting silver instead of gold. So Camden has it on this one. Um, Eleanor was the only daughter of Captain Sam Percy. And interesting enough, he never did name a vessel after his wife. His partner, um, Small, did have the Martha Small. And so Frank Small did have uh, one named after his wife. But Eleanor, um, who got to christen her own vessel here, was the daughter. Interesting that both Sam Percy and Holly Bean lived into their 80s. Holly Bean in 1921, when he passed, was 88 years old. Captain Sam Percy was born in 1856. I only know that because that's a hundred years before I was born. And he died in 1940. He closed his yard in 1920. But this was a man with impeccable timing. He sold the Wyoming in 1917. He had sold the Eleanor Percy before that. He basically sold his fleet of 16 schooners. He built for others. In fact, 41 vessels in all, being built 77. But he sold them in 1917. He followed that premise that every uh, investor knows you buy low and sell high. And we were in World War I. He knew the Yanks were going to help win it. And so after the war, there would be a glut of schooners. He built the Wyoming, the largest ever built, um, for 184,800, a little under 185,000. He sold it in 1917 for 350,000. Um, if we talk about Dunn and Elliott, they um, built Edna Hoyt in 1920. They launched the five masted. They, spelled, they spent about 280,000 to build it and they knew it was too much. Beautiful vessel and really famous because she was one of the last big ones to um, pull into New York Harbor and give them a show. But they sold her for 25,000. Um, in the early 1930s, 1931, the Edna Hoyt was still on the water and she was docked at New York Harbor. And in one week's time, 50,000 people, including Teddy Roosevelt's son, went to see her. So many people crossed over the gangplank that they broke the gangplank. And I only know this because of Down East Magazine, because when she turned 100 in 2020, they printed a wonderful article that I read and have kept actually. So um, we were at the end of the golden age of sale in the 1920s and it was over by 1924. And there's the Wyoming launched December 15, 1909. And as the largest, um, you're looking at 329.5 feet long on deck, 444 feet from the jib boom to the spanker boom, uh, a 50 foot beam, 
um, 30 feet deep. Um, you're looking at masts that were, um, oh, 120 lower mast and bringing up to 157 feet with the higher mast added. Um, 12,000 yards of sail. It's, um, yeah, it's a huge vessel. The Wyoming's first captain was Angus McLeod, uh, very well known. He had also been the captain of the Governor Brooks, named after the major investor, uh, which would have been B.B. Brooks, the governor from Wyoming, because Percy went far, not so unlike uh, Robert Bean, to look for new investors. And um, she made a profit. During the years that she sailed, for Percy and Small, uh, close to a million dollars. And she met her and in a storm with 65 mile per hour gales, which makes it like a hurricane, right? A hurricane, literally. Um, along with the Cora Cressy, a five-masted schooner, one of the few that survived Percy and Small's entire fleet. Um, she came in um, and was just off the coast of Cape Cod there at the Pollock Rip, the elbow, and it dropped anchor. And the Cora Cressy realized it was getting so bad, it would be better to take off for deep sea, thought that the Wyoming would follow, but she didn't. And in the morning, the light ship nearby could spot nothing of her. And all 13 members, including the captain, were lost, the entire crew. Um, which brings me to the end of the George and pretty much wrapping up this discussion, what happened to the George W. Wells, which for me, seems to be the most famous of all the Holly Bean vessels. She too met her end uh, in fierce scales, as many ships did. If they didn't burn or collide with another vessel, um, and of course there were German U-boats as well that were a threat in the uh, 1917 timeframe, it was storms. And this one uh, in the graveyard of the Atlantic was the Outer Bank, Diamond Shoals, and um, it was a September three. And it's interesting how the month of September uh, kind of repeats, but 1913, also a year I'm very drawn to in terms of maritime history and figures in important in terms of the births of some of my characters in my new book. Uh, but she was wrecked at Diamond Shoals. And um, the interesting thing is these photos are very recent and they're the actual timbers and what the park rangers and so many vessels have met their end in the outer banks there they leave the timbers exactly where they are and photograph and then storms come and time goes and they're covered again so they were first recorded as being seen in 1991 and as my Print says in 2004, and most recently after the Hurricane Teddy um, in 2020 at Diamond Shoals. So I find this fascinating. Um, the one where it's in color is actually the older photograph, the more recent one, 2020, you can see just a little bit of change. There are stories about the timbers and the wrecks, and there is a story that has moved me to write a sequel to Lavinia Wren. I have a story within a story of the wreck of the Alfred D. Snow off the coast of Ireland uh, in Waterford Harbor, um, under Broom Hill, if you know Ireland, uh, on a shoal, as so many of them meet their end on a shoal, um, and close uh, to Arthur's Town. So if you're looking at a map, the hook, and that lighthouse, the Hookhead, is the oldest, if not the oldest, one of the oldest lighthouses in the world. Uh, so also the drama of that and the connection. And when I look at Rex and I talk about the end of some of these glorious vessels, it's, we're all gonna meet our fate, but those we leave behind, those who tell our stories, their reaction, that's very important. And those who tell the stories of these wrecks, of these vessels, how they were built, where they went, what they meant to people um, is very significant. It's why I do what I do.
bringing me to another vessel that I, I like to talk about how it inspires art as well. Um, I saw in All the Glory, this is a gigantic painting, report me all well. You probably wouldn't have all your flags flying, um, but this is literally, the flags are the language. It's the way to communicate is saying, report me all well, as two vessels pa pass at sea. And I learned when I was writing Lavinia Wren and the Sailmakers that um, on shore, there's always a pecking order, whether you're the block maker or the owner of the shipyard. Not everyone talks to everyone, but when one vessel passes another, well, all the ships speak to all the others. Uh, perhaps the ocean levels the playing field quite a bit. This vessel was lost on September 11th, a day that shall live in infamy, in 1889 off Cape Henlopen, Delaware Bay, in gales of 104 miles per hour. And all the crew was saved. That is not the fate of every vessel. And a lot of credit goes to the men of the light station. Um, so the ship WR Grace, Chapman and Flint, look, Chapman and Flint and Thomaston moved to Bath, became the Deering Yard, the neighbor to Percy and Small, a uh, huge connection to WR Grace, happens to be an Irishman um, by birth. And so the history continues. And the very last, because this is the Camden Rockport Historical Society. You've probably seen this photo recently. George Henry Jennings had um, an exhibit and a showing for you all. This is the Annie. Um, in the description of this photo, and we also saw the George Wells, there was a kiln, a lime kiln, um, in uh, right along the harbor there. And I believe this is launch day, all the flags, and you can practically see the slipways. And in winter, um, many of these vessels were launched in December, not all of them in August and October, many of them in December for some reason or another. What a holiday celebration. So um, if there are any questions, I would, um, I would love to answer them. Uh, if you have any comments or all and I don't know if I can see those and we're probably let me see the chat can I see that yes oh I can read them out loud if anybody okay. has any questions you can type them in the Q&A or the chat thank you so much Irene that was fascinating and really great imagery you have it was it was thank a treat you. to thank see you. those photos it's hard not to see everyone else's faces so yeah <laughs> I know they're they're there. <laughs> All right. It looks like two of the sailmakers in the pick of Dunn and Elliot sail loft are African American. Do you know or make in the sail loft? I do not know. I do know that on the Wyoming there were many, um, many sailors of color. Not all. Um, a lot of them came from Colombia or the islands in the Caribbean. So you would also have mixed race. Um, there was one Swede. In the later years, especially on the big coal schooners, um, the crews were particularly diverse and there were many islanders. Um, and so not surprising that there would be. But as far as the sail loft in the 1870s, I do not know that for a fact. Mm. That picture is black and white, photo of a photo. It's probably uh, hard to tell. Um, so that I don't know. Yeah, I really like the one where uh, all the workers and their caps and mustaches and- Yeah, they, ha they did not have, and they were shipwrights. So they were not sailors, able-bodied or first mates or second mates. By the way, on all of those uh, vessels, the highest paid was the cook. The cook was always the highest paid and they could come from all over the world and crews changed. When they would come into yeah. port, sometimes they would change the crew up um, just, or some people would leave and some people would come. So that, that was always a factor as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question of just how you got into learning about this? Has this always been an interest of yours? 
Did something uh, spark it? it? Yeah, it, it has. But certainly I don't think these books would exist if I hadn't come to Maine. And the reason why I came to Maine was the pull of the sea. And I come from a Navy family. So Bath was particularly welcome because BIW builds Navy ships, basically. Uh, Arleigh Burke destroyers and the stealth, uh, destroy, the stealth destroyers as well, the Zumwalt class. So um, I was very at home here from the very beginning. And the funny thing about people who are Navy families or people who move around a lot, I always say we don't have roots, we have puddles if you're from a Navy <laughs> family. But when the family retires and has a chance to say, okay, where do we like best? We chose me and mm -hmm. we chose the mid coast for a very particular reason. And it has to do with it's uh, maritime history and it's ongoing uh, commitment to the coast and preserving our beaches. I mean, I brought my Christmas tree to Popham Beach when the season was mm -hmm. over and there were hundreds because they're trying to save the beach and that that's significant. So mm. yeah, I was definitely drawn to this place. It definitely has a rich and unique history, which I learned even more about tonight. Oh, I'm glad. It's... Um, some people are a little bit afraid to dive into maritime history. And that's why um, my books do have a romantic twist because after years of teaching, no one wants to read history unless you have a good story. And the best story has a little love going on. And yeah. um, if you want to keep hopeful and optimistic, that's the way to do it keep love on the horizon and um my story all these like people that. had full lives and you know oh. they were people and they loved and you know so some i love had, historical fiction that really brings yeah and alive. some had more luck than others and and some um but that everyone got dealt a hard blow as we do in life so all the sorrow is there it's the way they react to the sorrow that's that's so encouraging and inspiring. And they really mm -hmm. did live big, bold lives. So Hemingway used to write, only the bullfighters live life all the way up. If I had a conversation with Hemingway, I would say, have you met any seafaring sailors <laughs> and sea captains? Because I would have to say they live life all the way up as well, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Great sea stories. Yes. Does anybody have any questions? They're stunned into silence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, also wondering if you um, if you did a lot of research and then you had an idea for the story or if you had an idea for the story and then did the research. It's different for each book. So the first one was really inspired by place. I was, um, it's very hard to be creative when you're grading papers. You know, that red pen coming out, it's just very different. So I started writing my first book over the summer. So I was still teaching. And uh, Seguin Lighthouse, you know, I, I begin with the description of Popham and Seguin always have been drawn to lighthouses. And they really are the welcome and the warning for the coast. Um, if anyone is on Netflix, you can find The Last Light Keepers. It's a documentary. The end, they ask you to make donations. The Last Light Keepers. And Ford Reiki, who actually um, saved Halfway Rock. Uh, and that's off the point of Bailey's Island, halfway between Portland and Bailey's Island. Um, in the main point, I really write about Keepers of Maine, Inc. I create a company. And I had been here, I had gone to various lighthouses. It was really, I wasn't exploring the lighthouses until after I finished Daughters of Longreach. And I read an article about what Ford was doing. I didn't know him, I now know him. 
and I was writing a character uh, in the book and he's going to be a little on the dark side and a mystery writer, Bruce Robert Coffin interviewed me after it and he goes, oh, I thought he was. And then I had to explain, he was inspired by a person I met and I really thought was so wonderful that I had to like backpedal and, you know, kind of have the arc go in the right direction for him. But um, that really inspired the Keepers of Maine Inc. component of the main point. And also my own Navy family. Um, and the first two novels I weave present and past and the present storyline really goes from my parents' love story. Um, I call it how I met your mother instead of how I met your, or how I met your father instead of how <laughs> I met your mother. And there's a nurse's story within that. And I come from a family of nurses. So that was easy to do. Lavinia Wren, was really, it would not exist without Ida Elliott Clark. She handed me a Down East article from 1971 and it had the D.H. Rivers on the cover and a circle of the photo courtesy of Captain Arthur Elliott. And she had annotated my grandfather. Um, it was in black and white and I was, it was majestic. It was like magic. And I read the article about the sail loft and Lavinia Wren was born. I'm told I always have an orphan or someone who is lost. Um, I lost my mother too soon. So even in daughters and um, the continuation of that, the sequel, there is a story of that aspect. And in Lavinia Wren, she's an orphan of the civil war. So. The prison aspect of it is I decided Thomaston was just a jewel, you know, a town that went to sea. And the more I got into the history, I wanted to cover every aspect. So the railroad, the lime industry, and the prison all played a part. But my touchstones were Charles Ramlett Flint and Captain Arthur Elliott. And it spans 60 years. So in historical fiction, you, you mm -hmm. have to have chapter divides and you have to kind of keep everybody on the timeline. And that one goes straight through. It doesn't weave present and past. But the idea is that we're connected to our past. And when you trace generations, that, that becomes very clear. And my new project, um, I have a working title and I'm not ready really to reveal it, was inspired by Ida introducing me to the great, great granddaughter of Captain William Willie, who was lost when the Alfred D. Snow was wrecked. And that was a Thomaston built um, ship uh, in the, from the Watts yard, ironically. And uh, its story just really captivated me. And it's been written about, there's a song about it. Um, and- What uh, ship was that? The Alfred D. Snow. And in Ireland, it's part of Yankee Irish lore. Um, so the great, great granddaughter told me, and I've seen a piece of timber from that wreck, but they actually have a grave that was unmarked for years with all of the sailors, except for the three that could be identified and were shipped home, basically embalmed in Irish whiskey uh, and uh, were buried with their family plots. But the others, the Irish put all together at Ballyhack Cemetery and school children uh, in the la within the last 20 years actually made a memorial plaque. The great oh, granddaughter wow. had a chance to go see that. And as she says, they call it the tragedy. Hmm. It's interesting that Camden's historian called what happened to Holly Bean's son and how that great shipyard ended because of perhaps bad luck, you know, making a bet. And he too, I didn't mention it, but Robert Bean had a racehorse and they liked to like risk it all in hopes of winning big, but he made some mistakes and he couldn't pull out of it. And they call that the tragedy. Hmm. Uh, but if you go to uh, the Hook in Ireland and you're on the Wexford County or the Waterford side, they talk about the tragedy of the loss of the Alfred D. Snow. And so I write about that um, in my new book um, with a different spin. I go from 1931 and they're really looking at it through historical eyes, 
we don't go back to 1888. But look at the history. You lose that vessel in Ireland, and that was wrecked in 1888. Holly Bean built the largest five-mastered wooden hull vessel in Camden in 1889. Mm. I mean, it was ongoing and it went on for a couple of more decades. And that's the history I'm focusing on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. All right. And they tell you? me, I have one more. Um, Janet told me that there will be an opportunity through the Historical Society. They may be having some events and my books may be there for sale because I couldn't come to the library. Oh, good, <laughs> good. <laughs> if you're interested in any or all of them, then hopefully um, they'll be available sometime soon in Camden, so. Be great. And I do think they're at the Owl and Turtle if I'm allowed to do a plug. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> they are at the Owl, for yeah. sure. Janet, did you have anything from the Historical Society yes. to share? Yes, I do. I want to thank Irene uh, so much for um, giving this talk. I just, um, I'm just amazed. I just keep learning something new every day about Camden's history. And I've been here 47 <laughs> years, I think. Um, so when I, um, and yes, uh, we will be having some events at the homestead and the museum. And so I would hope that maybe Irene would even come up and sign, do some book signing, oh, sure. uh, since she missed that opportunity tonight to do that. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to our first speaker of the uh, winter series. Um, and I hope you'll come to our uh, subsequent talks. And I want to just tell you a little bit about what they are. Um, next month on February 11th, um, which is a Sunday afternoon, we're having Kate McMahon from the National Museum of African American History and Culture uh, coming to speak on the African American uh, community in Warren, Peterborough. Um, so that should be very interesting. I've heard her talk on slavery in Maine. Um, in March, on the 26th, we have Charles Lagerbaum from Northport, our uh, Maine Marine historian. And he's speaking on the USS Maine, the history, life, death, and remembrance of the ship that took a, a, a nation to war. And the last one is April 21st, Daniel Lambert, a filmmaker, is speaking on Maine at Gettysburg. So lots of history to be uncovered. We have so a comment. Stay safe, everybody, and Whoops. we'll see you next month, I hope. Yes, All we right. have one comment. Great presentation. Dovetailed nicely with my visit to Bath Shipbuilding Museum a couple of years ago. Oh, well, that's nice to hear. Thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Irene. All Thank right. you, Janet. Okay, take care. Thank Good night. You. Thank you.